Welcome to the Center for Ecological Sciences. The work in this department can be roughly categorized into the fields of ecology, evolution, and behavior, but often our research overlaps across these fields. Let me tell you a little more. Let's start with ecology. Ecology is studied as an interaction between organisms and their environments. Now these organisms can be predators, prey, or even mates and they all require critical things from their physical environment, such as the right kinds of nutrients and minerals, temperature, or even space. Let's see what some of the researchers in our department are currently working on. Hi, my name is Navendu Pagi, and I'm a PhD student here at the Center for Ecological Sciences. For my PhD, I'm studying diversity and distribution of trees in the evergreen forest of Western Ghats. The evergreen forests are one of the most diverse ecosystems of our country and most of the trees that you see in the evergreen forest are not found anywhere else, that is, they are endemic. Now even within the Western Ghats, there are species which are found that are distributed throughout the uh, Western Ghats and there are species that are found in not more than one locality. So the question that I'm trying to address for my PhD is what are the ecological reasons that make certain species so widely distributed and make a few other species so confined to a small area. Having seen an example of how distributions of trees can vary across space, now let's look at how communities of trees have changed across time. And by time, we mean across hundreds of centuries. Hi, uh, so I work on peat. Peat is a... Um... Peat is formed when plants grow and die in a water-rich environment and accumulate one on top of the other. There are two good things about peat. The first thing is that um, you can find which plants died in a certain layer using maybe pollen grains or the remnant plant fragments. The other good thing about peat is that you know exactly when these plants in each layer have died by measuring something called the radioactive carbon in a given layer. Now for example, this particular layer that I have collected from the surface is about a thousand years old and this layer, just three meters below this layer, is about 40,000 years old. Um, now we have two pieces of information. One, um, which plants died in what layer? And the second is that how old these plants are, okay, when did they die really? So using these two pieces of information, we can reconstruct how vegetation might have looked in the past. And I work on um, a peat in the Nilgiris, very close to Uti. Um, using a similar approach, I have dated this particular peat. And we know that it's one of the oldest in the world at a minimum age of about 50,000 years. Now using the approach that I described above, where you use um, the kind of plants that lived and the age at which they died, I'm trying to reconstruct what kind of vegetation, how vegetation has changed in the past 50,000 years for the Nilgiris. 50,000 years does seem like a lot. But now, let's look at processes that have been operating for millions of years. We at CES anchor all our work in the fact that evolution has shaped the world around us. By evolution, we mean any change in characteristics or traits that are heritable, as in passed from parents to offspring. This process occurs within a population across many generations. We can study evolution in many ways, from reconstructing histories through the fossil record to understanding processes at the population level. Generally, natural species are distributed uh, as more or less discrete units which are known as populations. Uh, so populations are defined as <clears throat> a group of individuals who breed among themselves. However, uh, these are not entirely isolated units. There is a bit of migration among themselves, which means that individuals can go from one population to another. And depending on that, what one can look at is the structure of the population to identify how many such populations are there 
in a particular region of space where the species is distributed. That is what I have uh, looked at in my work. And I have worked on a species of paper wasp known as Ropolidia marginata. Uh, and these are social wasps, so they live in groups, they live in colonies. And so they inhabit a huge part of uh, South Asia. But I have sampled several such colonies from southern India. Many of us are also interested in understanding the relationships between species. The next project explores the evolutionary relationships among lizards. So, um, I work on this really ancient and fascinating group of uh, family of lizards called skinks. And uh, these are uh, lizards that are found uh, all over the world. They're very, very diverse. And in India, you have around 60 odd species. So, what I'm interested to find out is to uh, know how these species, how these lizards are related to each other. And uh, in order to do this, I obviously have to travel uh, all over the country and I basically get to see a lot of different landscapes and a lot of different habitats uh, where these uh, lizards occur. And uh, how I do it is basically build uh, DNA based uh, evolutionary trees in order to find out how they are related to each other. One can also ask where different species are found and how they are related to each other. Varun shows us how exciting the biogeography of frogs can be. So this group of frogs, uh, Nictibatricus, is uh, endemic to the Western Ghats, meaning uh, they are found only in the Western Ghats and uh, also the other thing is that in the Western Ghats you find many species of these frogs. Uh, at the last count, uh, there were 27 described species of frogs from this genus. Now the other interesting thing is that uh, these frogs are found only in uh, perennial uh, streams, which means that the streams which flow throughout the year in the rainforests of the Western Ghats. And uh, the frogs in this genus uh, come in a variety of different sizes, meaning the smallest frog in this genus is, is really very small, as big as a thumbnail. And the largest frogs grow up to uh, 8 centimeters. Uh, now what I do is, uh, I try and go to different parts in the Western Ghats and uh, I try to find out what species of Nictibatricus are found there and then I do this for different places in the Western Ghats so that I get an idea about what species of frogs are found where. So that gives me an idea about their distribution. Now the second thing what I do is I basically try and find out how these different frogs are related to each other based on their DNA and this tells me uh, the evolutionary relationships between these different species of frogs so that uh, by looking at that and uh, their distribution I can try and find out how there is so much diversity of this group of frogs in the western parts. Many of us study how and why animals behave in the way they do. Behavior can be studied as interactions between individuals within or across species and how those individuals alter their decisions and responses depending on the environment. We also know that behaviors are not always fixed, but are flexible and can evolve. For example, did you know that female crickets have to make complex decisions when choosing their mates? Uh, in crickets, males call, uh, the call which we all hear, to attract females. And females use these calls uh, to localize males and also to distinguish between them. Now generally uh, in night we hear a lot of uh, chirp, chirping of uh, crickets and that is because a lot of crickets of the same species get together and produce uh, choruses where a lot of males are calling at the same time. Uh, for a female which now has to locate a male and mate with it it becomes a problem because it has to choose one among the many. Uh, the problem that I have been working on is to look at how females actually choose a particular male among many males. And what about tiny wasps? They have the challenge of finding the right host tree in a very large and complex world. Uh, figs act as nurseries or incubators for the uh, offspring of the pollinating wasps. 
Once the offspring have finished developing, the uh, males mate with the females inside the figs. The males are essentially flightless and after mating, the males die inside the figs. The females exit the figs and they fly and disperse to locate other fig trees that are, that are receptive for pollination uh, in their vicinity. Uh, but the problem is not that easy because often uh, these female pollinating fig wasps have to travel distances uh, sometimes greater than uh, tens of kilometers. Uh, these wasps are really small, they are only 2 millimeters in size. And also to add in to the uh, complexity, uh, these wasps live only for a single day. So uh, the question I'm trying to address is uh, how do these pollinating fig wasps, which are 2 millimeters in size, locate uh, another host tree in their vicinity, uh, which, are, which is usually present at uh, very large distances, uh, and also how do they do this within their short lifespans of 24 hours. Now let's scale up for minute insects. Have you wondered why male elephants have tusks? We have. For a PhD, I looked at the evolution of tusks in elephants. In Asian elephants, only the males have tusks, but the females do not have tusks. So there's a theory that uh, male elephants may use their tusks in male-male competition for mates. That is, they use tusks as a weapon when fighting with each other. There's also another theory that says that tusks are ornaments, male ornaments, that make the males very attractive to female elephants. Therefore, males with long tusks should have higher mating success. So I went to a place called Kaziranga National Park in Assam. In that, there's a wild uh, population of elephants, around 1,200 elephants. About 50% of the males in that forest do not have tusks for some reason. We do not know why. So I looked at uh, males, adult males fighting with each other, especially tusked males and tuskless males, and tried to see if tusked males uh, won more often than the tuskless males. I also looked at the mating behavior and tried to see if female elephants prefer to mate with tusked males instead of tuskless males. But what I found was that uh, there are other male traits such as body size and something called mass and those two traits are more important both in male-male competition as well as in female mate choice. I don't know if you've noticed but the study of ecology, evolution and behavior requires a range of skills and creative tools. Many of us conduct extensive field work to understand the natural world but we also use state-of-the-art molecular tools and complex computer simulations. When we are in the field, we record detailed observational data, conduct surveys, run manipulative experiments, and collect samples. We can also conduct experiments in the lab where we are able to control the environment. With such data, we can explore the underlying patterns or processes of the natural world. But for some questions, computer simulations that virtually reconstruct scenarios can be a better tool. You've already seen how to study phenomena in the wild using observations and experiments. But some phenomena, such as the formation of clouds and the weathering of rocks, say, occur over such vast time scales that it is impossible to study them using experiments in the real world. For this reason, we use simulations which essentially are computer models that mimic the real world. Uh, what you can see here are a flock of Canada geese flying. You can see that they fly in all these interesting myriad patterns. Okay, now um, we could ask then how do geese form these patterns while flying? Is it possible for geese to form these patterns using merely information about how their neighbors are behaving? Would geese be able to form these formations simply by following one another, perhaps the closest neighbor? To answer this question, we have created this computer simulation where these arrows essentially represent individual keys. And by building in certain rules into our simulation, wherein each arrow merely follows its immediate neighbor, we see that you can in fact simulate formations very similar to what you have seen in the keys. So now you've seen some of the questions we study at CES. But there's so much more we'd love to tell you about 
and so much more we still don't have answers to. This open day, we have fun presentations and exhibits that show you more of the interesting questions and organisms we study. Do stop and talk to any of us if you have questions. But stick around, we're about to air a few more documentaries about the wondrous world we live in.